Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Commander Clash podcast, where we talk all things Commander. And this week, we have a cool topic, cards that have gotten better over time. So cards that are either mediocre or possibly very good already. And then over time, as new cards are released, they have gotten even better. Uh, joined with me today is Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive, rocking the outlaws of Thunder Junction <laughs> uh, outfit. Now I know you're in a Western, <laughs> Seth. How's it going? Howdy. Uh -huh. uh, do, do, doing well. How are you, partner? <laughs> Wait, partner. do people tip their cowboy hats or is that a I fedora? Think, yeah, hat? I think I think they tip your cowboy hats. <laughs> you do? Yeah, I don't know. True. I need to watch more westerns. <laughs> Yeah, Seth, From well California, known. You know a lot cowboy. about cowboys, right? <laughs> You're a huge sure. fan of westerns, I've heard. <laughs> yep. I mean, technically, I have consumed a few pieces of western content, like anime, but that's about it. I mean, I've actually watched a lot, but I don't like that many westerns. <laughs> Tomer, a uh, cowboy bebop, I've heard is your favorite western. Why are we talking about westerns? Yeah, is it? Again, Seth, you're throwing us off. We are doing nothing about westerns <laughs> in this doing... podcast. <laughs> We're talking about old things. Tomer, are you old? Westerns uh, are old. Well, my, gotten better my back over time? to those are. I think you yeah. have. <laughs> Aw, thanks. And and uh, you're looking very good yourself, Mister Codfather. How you doing? Yes, I I like to think I'm a fine wine. I, I may be a boomer, but the hopefully silver I've box better over time. <laughs> uh, so we're gonna talk about cards that have gotten better over time. Uh, very exciting topic. Before we get into that, though, we have our sponsors. Uh, today's show is brought to you by Ultimate Guard, premium protection for your trading cards. So all the gaming accessories you see on Clash, our play mats, sleeves, etc., are supplied by Ultimate Guard. Uh, so check out ultimateguard.com. And also Card Conduit, the easiest way to sell your magic cards. Card Conduit lets you skip all the typing, time, and work associated with buy listing. Their curated service lets you send in as many cards as you want with buy list value of $1 or more, and you pay just a 5% service fee. You can use a sorted service where you list and sort your cards and pay only 2%. You get a detailed report and fast payment once your order is processed. Get 10% off by heading over to cardconduit.com slash mtggoldfish. All right. It is time for the ultimate guard comment of the week I, I i heard we had a we had a typo we had a typo in our segment uh so we're, we're gonna switch it up to comments of the week <laughs> last week's episode was weird old cards from vaporeon 344 the irony of tomer hating on mind's eye and loving symmetry matrix <laughs> is bold <laughs> 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 All right. My defense is I thought Symmetry Matrix might be good enough when it was released. And then I played it. And then I was like, you know what? White and Boros just had better options. I still run it. Like, I, I made like $25 decks. And guess what? I don't ha have the, the money for troubles and pair pairs in that deck, you know? So. You got to do what you got to do, but I, I don't think either card is good, all right? <laughs> I don't think either card is very good, but if you're in, like, an extreme desperation mode, fine, run them. Hey, Mind's Eye is only, like, three bucks. Is Mind's Eye a budget card, at least, Tomer? Can we justify it on that end? Eh? Eh? It's three bucks. That's three bucks. That's, no. No, no we're never. So lucky it wasn't on that podcast. We'd be Mind's <laughs> Eye all over the place. <laughs> uh, okay. Let's get into our topic. So cards have gone better over time. This one's very exciting because I, I love pulling out my cards and being like, wow, we got even better. Uh, and I got an interesting one for you guys. Uh, so the first one up is off-color fetches, right? So we all know fetch lands are great. And I used to be of the opinion that you just played a couple, right? So when you, when you play a deck, like say a Golgari deck, right? Verdant Catacombs has two colors that you can fetch, right? Both Force and Swamp. But do you play things like, say, Windswept Heath, uh, which fetches green and white? Uh, you can use the green mode to fetch green, right? The white mode is kind of useless. So I used to just run a couple of fetches. Now I load up every single legal fetch I can <laughs> because of the surveil lands, right? Like now, before, like the, the fetch lands did absolutely nothing, right? Like they were kind of just like a dual land that maybe triggered landfall. If I was a landfall deck, I'd play more, but they kind of did nothing. So I'd keep them to a minimum. Now I always want fetch lands to get that juicy surveil value. Do you guys do that? Do you guys play an overabundance of fetch lands? I don't want to hear deck thinning, Krim. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. I don't, I don't like deck thinning. <laughs> But do you play them for surveil lands, for 
uh, Mystic Sanctuary value, even like Landfall in a non-Landfall deck. Like now you have Feel of the Dead, things like that. Like th there's reasons to be triggering Landfall outside of a green Landfall deck. Do you play off-color fetches? I believe it's optimal, I, I but I don't usually do it because I really dislike the flavor of it. Like, it feels weird to me in your, like, Golgari deck to have, like, this white land, like a windswept teeth or something. So I used to, I used to just play every fetch possible, and then I have cut down to trying only play fetches that are in my color identity. Even though I know there's no technically nano symbols, so it doesn't really apply to color identity, but it just feels weird to me. So, yeah, I, I try not to, but I do believe it's optimal to just play every fetch possible. I might be misremembering, but weren't you a big proponent of the hybrid rule going away? Like you should be able to run like hybrid cards in like a monocolor yeah. deck. Yeah, isn't that they the same thing? That they been called it. out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's a personal no. restraint thing, Tomer. The other upside, and I think this might win you over to my side, Tomer, is the downside of playing ten fetches in every deck or eight or whatever the max is, depending on your color combination, is it does jack up the price of your deck by like two hundred dollars unnecessarily. So that's the other upside. Is my commander clash decks look a little bit cheaper because I'm not just jamming ten fetches in all of them? I mean, I I, I don't either because. I actually used to run more fetches and I know I do less now, even though there's more reason like Richard was 100% correct. It's just better and better lands to be fetching. And also like if you're in any sort of deck that cares about lands in the graveyard or anything something like that, it just keeps getting better. Uh, my original, the original time that I used to run off color fetches was when I used to run black based decks uh, for like Cabal Coffers and stuff. I used to be a big proponent of Rings of Bright Hearth to uh, turn your <laughs> fetch lands into rampant growth. That was an old tech of mine <laughs> that I used to use a lot in like a lot of different decks. I would run extra fetches just because Rings of Bright Hearth was so good in particular decks. My Chandra Super Friends deck, for example, too. Rings of Bright Hearth was in there anyway, so I might as well throw in all the fetch lands possible. But yeah, it's it's expensive and I don't like shuffling. So I started taking out all those fetch lands from my decks. <laughs> I told you, I, I'm like anti-fetch land <laughs> just because I don't like shuffling my deck anymore. I'm the weirdo, apparently. <laughs> I, I, I've, I've definitely, I just do whatever fetch lands I have available to me, like on my desk when I deck build. Um, <laughs> but for the most part, I would be doing... <laughs> Uh, probably somewhere near Richards, right? Like, uh, like budget aside, because I, I I have all the fetches and whatnot. So, like, I guess whichever ones are near me are the ones that I just load into the deck that I can play. Uh, because surveil, there's so many tap lands now. Um, like like Alpine Meadows and your Boros deck. There's the snow versions, right? And then there's the the Ravnik versions. And so many lands have land types now, and I just want to have all the colors I can get, so I can be greedier with my colorless mana. So uh, that that's that's why I try to run about ten fetches, but maybe let's just say six because I think ten is a bit excessive, and because I'm too lazy to find the rest. <laughs> That that's a lot. I, I run out of fetchable targets. I'm running like, you know, eight fetch lands, like four fetchable targets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I already have like, only one okay. of these. Well, it Ouch. gets sketchy. Oh, it gets no. sketchy. Right? Like I just built a two color deck. I I have room for like three basics, and I'm trying to cut them. And I'm like, wait a minute, I have way more fetch lands than things I can fetch. Oh, so have you? I'm like, does the stock of the cycling land go up? You know the. The scattered but, groves type yeah. land because they enter tap, play they can those. be fetched. <laughs> they can be I fetched. I'm so running out of targets for fetch lands. <laughs> have you run out in a game yet? Have you actually like, or do you just worry that it will happen eventually? Or have you actually run into that where you like tried to fetch and like had to fail to find? <laughs> I'm, I'm, you guys have seen me do that all the time. You guys, well, <laughs> like, we saw your far seek and mono green. You, <laughs> you hit the land tax. You're like, well, I get one land. That's all that's left in my deck because I <laughs> I run so many non-basics and so many non-basic land type lands that it is very hard to to do like you hit like two ramp like you hit our kaomancer's math or something and like a land tax like you're done no more basics nothing else to fetch out so do you do well. you i get i guess do you just start adding urborg and yavamai in all your decks regardless of the colors because that could um, kind yes, of alleviate. They, yeah, but that. they always go in all my decks anyway because they turn oh, on Glacial God. Chasm and Maze of Myth. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> Every deck starts with an Orborg or a Yavavaya if they're in their colors. And if you play one for me, you just powered up my deck. Wait, <laughs> so you could put them you could put them outside the colors. That's what I was thinking. Like, do you just if you're in like a mono white deck, do you Wait. throw in Yavamaya and Yeah. 
Yeah. She just blew my mind over her <laughs> right. Yeah. There's just no one color of identity. Yeah. Those lands in every... It's legal. Yes. <laughs> one of my favorite... That's one... why Mono Blue, I would play... Oh, Alpha my Mono. God. I, so I, I, like I, an acid my, I, I changed my card to, like, Maze of Ithgod even better. Yeah. Because <laughs> one today, of my favorite... I was zero days old when I learned you could put Yavamaya <laughs> in a Mono White deck, and yep. then now you're... <laughs> you're Maze of Ithgod World Mana? Yeah. One of my absolute favorite wow. budget brews from when I started writing back in 2015 was a mono white daring King of Sheldor yeah, deck I remember that, that utilized two old uh, enchantments that basically said like on each person's upkeep they take damage equal to the number of like swamps they control. So I ran Urborg in the deck and a bunch of all the ways to fetch it. And then I would like burn everybody at the table while making a bunch of tokens and yes. gaining life off the souls attendance and stuff. I love that deck. Nobody cared about that deck. It was still bad, <laughs> but it's a cool attack, right? It's cool. That is cool attack. Basic lands sure. and shambles. I have no room for any of this. Okay, <laughs> oh, Seth, no. hit us with a card oh. that has All gotten right. better over time. I I, I got an easy one because I'm just going to piggyback on you and get this out of the way. I was going to talk about it later, but uh, Forest Ramp. I think Forest Ramp, for many similar reasons to what Richard is saying, has gotten better and better. Like 10 years ago, the difference between like nature's lore and rampant growth was pretty minimal. Like it was still better, but not nearly as big as it is today. Cards like Wood Elves have gone way back up in value for me. And the reason is a few years ago, we got Triomes giving us three color fetchable lands, which make all these lands that can fetch four is so powerful in four and five color decks. And then as Richard was saying, we just got surveil lands that have the basic land type. So now you can use your nature's lore, not just to ramp and fix your mana, but also control the top of your deck and fill your graveyard. So uh, those cards are just like essential to me. They've always been good, but I think right now they are at their peak value where, and they're probably just gonna get keep getting better, right? Cause wizards is gonna keep printing surveil lands and triome lands and lands with land types. So I think these cards are going to continue to get better, but they have gotten like a ridiculous Mount better since I started playing Commander. It went from yeah. S to S plus. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> basically, like Nature's Lore is like one of the best cards in Magic: The Gathering. Well, now, like just <sighs> fetching a simple forest, right? But now you can fetch a Surveil Land. That's disgusting. It, it like hurts to rampant growth now. Like when I have the rampant growth, I'm like, oh, like this isn't surveilling. This isn't getting three colors worth of mana. Like, this could be a nature's lore. This is doing so much more. So yeah. We'll get surveil basic soon. We need not more non normalized non basic Kate. I'm so tired of this <laughs> nonsense. <laughs> oh, just wait until we get further down our list. <laughs> it's, it just hurts me. It's like, oh, I need I need to have all my nine dollar surveil lands with my six dollar forest <laughs> ramp. Well, what else is cheap? What else? They were cheap. Play, play what else? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Phil made out like a bandit. I hear. The the, the one thing that will counterpoint this though is that Wizards is printing more and more non basic land ramp. So before I would play four uh, mana like Sky Shroud Claim or whatever, the, the one that fetches two forests. Now I just skip that entirely and just play like either Pierce Whim, which is four mana, uh, Arch Druid's Charm, or Hour of Promise, the five mana ramp two non basics. Uh, open the way. I like non basics. Open the way. Yeah. Oh, open, open the way is ridiculous. Uh, but like surveil is cool and all, but I can actually get two like crazy lands that are <laughs> non basic. Uh, so that's yeah. the one thing holding back nature's lore and stuff. The minute they keep printing like three mana sorcery ramp, I'm like, I'm, I'm all for it for non basics. Tomer, we're talking about land still. <laughs> yes. What do you got for us? <laughs> I'm going to keep, keep the land train going. Uh, bounce lands. Um, I've been big on bounce lands since I started playing Commander in 2011 with my first deck, Zedru, but I only liked bounce lands in white decks because they, to me, they enabled catch-up ramps so well. Like, my favorite white card to this day uh, is Land Tax, and I jammed Land Tax into my Zedru deck immediately from the pre-con, um, and it worked so well with the bounce lands because the bounce lands put you back a land, not putting you down mana, but puts you back a land, and that enables your catch-up ramp, um, like Knight of the White Orchid, Loyal Warhound, all that stuff. They have more of those recently, like Archaeomancer's map, so it just keeps getting better. But uh, now I run all the bounce lands in every deck because MDFCs 
and channel lands are now 10 times better with bounce lands. Like you, if you early on, you play an MDFC as just a land, and then you want to have the spell later on, you play a bounce land, you return to your hand, and now you can cast the other side of the MDFC. Same thing with channel lands. You could play it as a land drop early on, but next, if you want your Odawara or whatever to bounce something later on, uh, you just bounce it back to your hand and then cast or channel the, the Odawara or whatever. So now it's like, why wouldn't you put all the balance lands you can, at least the mana fixing ones, in all your decks. Because if you're running MDFC, if you're running channel lands, like it's just gonna be ten times better now. So yeah, now it goes into every deck. Are you are you ever at a point now, Tomer, where you wanna play Amulet? Just so Ooh. that all like Ooh. then you can uh, like like just a, I've a thought straight up <laughs> normal <laughs> amulet, right? Like, 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 as a spelunking yeah, spelunking is good. Yeah, at least amulet. bunking wrath uh, ramps you. Yeah, that's worth it. Sure, amulet comes but off like, of saga. So like, <laughs> that's true. Get off saga, and you can just play like guildless commons. Bounce a like float a mana, bounce it back, have untapped guildless commons. Right. So, are we approaching that point where there are enough tap lands to where I might like like. MDFCs included, Seth, can now come into play untapped, right? I, I am so, fully on board with Splunking. I mean, like, though, it just doesn't do anything, right? Like, it, I mean, it untaps your lands, but it doesn't progress your game plan enough, I don't think. I don't know. Is Amy like, actually in the conversation? I am tapping your mana. So much. And I've tried yeah. it before. I, I, I've never actually got it in game. I've tried it a couple times, but just imagine you, like, you know, turn three amulet or whatever, like whatever, right? And then you just open the way. Like that's ridiculous, yeah. right? Or you so do yeah, like or... any like double land ramp. Like imagine you our promise for a uh temple of the false god and ancient tomb. Like that amulet Almost free. back for itself like Damn. so fast, right? Let alone like doing like stupid bounce land shenanigans with multiple land drops. That's so, not even accounting for all the things, a saga. Like... Urza Saga yeah. is key. You can actually see it, right? By, you can by see using it. Urza Saga. Ooh. So uh, actually, I think Krim is cooking. I think we... we... I, I also... <laughs> what do we I, cut I'm for? Curious. Another basic? <laughs> How do I tap yeah. my deck? Throw, throw out the basics. <laughs> I, I, I am curious, though, because remember, it is all permanents are coming yeah, into play untapped now, right? So uh, uh, one thing that I've noticed is that more cards are getting balanced when they try to make treasures, let's just say like yep. Gala Greeters or something like that. They are tap treasures. Mm. Wait, <laughs> amulet untaps might, everything? I've that never might, actually yeah, read amulet. That might be the yeah. biggest argument, actually, is, yeah, it seems like they figured out that tap treasures is a safety valve for treasures. And even in just, like, Thunder Junction, we've seen a bunch of really powerful cards that can make a lot of treasures, but they're always tapped. So maybe that right. is actually, if you combine all that together, maybe it's worth it. Like, amulet might yeah. be looking yeah. better. It might. Especially yeah, with be bounce lands to tie it back, right? I mean, as they just previewed whatever another bounce land, mm -hmm. I don't see, yeah, I, you know, I, I'm just starting to think, you know, like maybe amulet's just good enough. But how many I tap lands are you really going to play? Cooking. How That's many tap thing. lands but are you actually going to have? It's amulet. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't, <laughs> I, yeah. But like, you, you don't want to have like a bad mana base on the hopes that you find like your amulet of, of vigor but every single game. It's, but like, it's if you're not running even all that a bad ramp. animate, it's not even a bad mana base because like you'll still have cards like, let's just go with Fetid Pool, Sunken Hollows, right? All these like, lands that'll have land types or maybe my mdfcs there's a lot of things that can just come into play untapped it's, I mean, uh, it's such a low mana investment for one mana that like true. i i think that it actually might be worth a look at i mean i don't know if the card's still absurdly expensive or not but like it's like I, one of the best modern decks I mean, yeah, is, like, but they have reprinted it a few times. It's been in like secret layers and stuff. I guess also surveil lands might play into this. I've noticed, like exactly. for me, surveil lands have like risen up to shock land tier, where I'm just playing all of them that I can in every deck. Yep. So if you're playing a bunch of triomes and a bunch of uh, surveil lands, that's a big chunk of your dual lands that are going to be coming into play tab. So I think you're right. I think Amulet maybe should be on our list as a card. I don't know if I've gotten to the point where I'm going to start jamming it in most of my decks, but I think it's a card that's definitely gotten better over time i i personally like i try to limit the amount of lands that enter tapped in my decks to like five or six like if i'm 38 lands oh. 30 of oh. two, 32 of them are going to be untapped because i just I really don't like that we, we are <laughs> Which, not the same we are not the same i, I, I agree with tomer <laughs> so so people are like bounce land like oh uh, it goes it comes into play tapped right but it's it's draw a card right because when you bounce the land back to hand you effectively drew a card if 
So it's basically one mana draw a card. So let's say every single turn in the game, you play a tap land and it draws you a card. If I asked you, would you pay five mana over like five turns to draw five cards? Would you do it? That's like a that's like a free heuristic study or you know something like that going on, right? Like people, it's it's like a mind's eye that costs zero, Seth. Like you should be happy <laughs> playing tap lands that give you card advantage. So the argument that you have too many tap lands, I feel doesn't hold and you can also sequence it in a way such that this doesn't matter to you right like on turn one no one's really you know counting that lost mana as lost mana right and there are other ways to do that throughout the game so i really enjoy bounce lands like tomer in all colors uh even like you know non um here's non-white colors and also you can Remember, with all the searching now, you can use it as a tutor, right? Like, I can crop rotation a bounce land, get back onto inversion, onto inversion. Yeah. Like, it, it just makes everything so versatile now. So, I really like bounce lands. How many is too many? I don't know. But I currently play every single two-color one that I can get my hands on, guildless commons. And I even bust out the Karoo sometimes. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Like, the really old ones that, re really? that essentially cost two mana, right? Ah, uh, you make those it up ones are right. you have a KO Mancer's map, it Ooh. doesn't even matter, right? Like you just I like slap down all your lands again. So <laughs> I'm I'm a huge bounce land. Do you ever uh, get support. burned though, where like you have a start, you keep mulliganing, and you see like okay, I have like two bounce lands, and <laughs> this hand is gonna be awful as I deploy <laughs> two it. Bounce like, lands, temple. Maybe, maybe with land. Outlaws of Thunder Junction, <laughs> where they've added a, yet another one, but so far it's never <laughs> happened. I've seen too many people punish if, if you're too tap land heavy, like, yeah, okay, you can make a card advantage or whatever, but I want to progress my board, especially because I, I, I love playing like combat decks and I like attacking and I don't want to spend so many turns being like, I could have played this two drop on turn two, but instead I'm playing oh, a tap land or something like that. So like there is a balance to be struck. I'm not like all <laughs> tap lands, but I think like five or six is like fine. But the other oh, reason wait, we... that's okay. it? You only play five to six? <laughs> yeah, how many do you how many lands enter the tap for you, Krim? I I go like again, I'm digging deep, right? I'm using the Kaldheim tap lands with anything with typings in it, I yeah. would probably put it in. Ooh, wow. it, it, just you, a you mean dual the snow tap lands Ooh. with no yes, value? No Those are so bad. Uh, <laughs> why? Like, what are you doing? Why? What's the purpose <laughs> of them? Even in aggro well, decks, Krim? Like like your yeah. rogue deck. Well, my rogue deck, luckily in blue and black, I, I have a good amount of untapped lands. But yeah, I mean, I just like having all the fetchable types. Are you like, right? are you like, casting like cryptic command yeah. to like, <laughs> I mean, I you know, obliterator or something? Yeah, like, I didn't yeah, need all like, these colored pips. I, I, have I, the got, option. I got greedy, like I got greedy, like, like, like spells, right? Like, I'm going Phyrexian Vindicator and Gratuitous Violence, right? Like, I'm trying to do all of that. So. I, I I don't know. I mean, I guess I care about the color, right? I mean, that's 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 why I also I, I I mean that and being lazy, as I've mentioned, I like chromatic lantern still. I would say on bounce lands, the other reason they've gotten better is my big fear and why I stopped playing them was strip mine, because I would always strip mine yeah. people's bounce lands. But I don't think you can do that anymore because the utility and lands have gotten too strong. And if you strip mine a bounce land, you're going to get wrecked by a Field of the Dead or a Flip Dowsing Dagger or something. So I think Bounce Lands are actually like strip mine proof now. It's just not, you can't do it anymore because there's too many, too many not better targets you need proof. to save your strip mine for. There's still, th there, look, there are tons of times we've had to make the correct play, but there are the spite <laughs> plays. So I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> All right, Krim, hit us with the card. Okay, y'all just like aren't. Oh God, it's Seth. He's got the hat on, so now I'm got. Uh, like, Grim. Grim you Grim. all are not understanding the value. What is the one <laughs> thing? What is MTG Twitter, whatever, like social media discourse on the daily? Farewell. Yeah. And eat uh, like Ward, right? <laughs> and Ward. gets around <laughs> Ward, like like just ba like I'm talking. We have. Waves of people crying about Ward. Well, if you Voja haven't heard about particular, it was like the <laughs> Voja Ward. No, 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 because there's all there's always people like this shouldn't have Ward. Why does this have Ward? I'm not even talking about Voja, which I have also found to be not that bad. Um, but like edicts, edicts have gotten better. As there, I, I, I know, I know, I don't exactly feel bad about, like, every time I've seen edicts, like, make an example. The edicts have gotten better. Soul shatter. These are all things 
that now are just like they're so efficient at getting around all the weird protection like indestructible is a, a stapled onto everything everything can get indestructible everything can get protection from a certain color but you know what it can't do it can't save you from an edict right and the edicts now they are kind of still like oh maybe your opponent gets to choose but they've gotten so much better that they feel like they're almost just per like targeted removal that gets around all the nonsense hmm. so I I'll ag <laughs> okay I'll agree in the sense that the edicts that they've printed have gotten better like soul shatter is definitely better than diabolic edict and they've started to print some edicts that like make you kill your opponent's biggest thing or highest mana value thing so I think they've made better edicts but I don't think Diabolic Edict or just like an edict is any better now than it was 10 or 20 like years ago. Whoa, 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 whoa. No, 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 no. Okay, well, I mean, yeah, like, I, I, it's more of a style of card, right? Okay. I'm not saying Diabolical Edict is better than it was. Like, I just think edicts have gotten better and they are worth more over time. Like, I think now oh, we're yeah. at a point where I, I really like edicts. I you like well, you, 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 they're I better warm, never not worth putting in my deck still. <laughs> oh. yeah, well, Richard, Richard wouldn't even. You know what? You know what's funny? If your, opponent, if your opponent has an indestructible creature and you're holding like a doom blade, you're mega sad, right? But if your opponent has a three drop that you want to kill, and then they have also a five drop, and you're holding soul shatter, you're mega sad. But your opponent <laughs> didn't even do anything. They didn't even like waste <laughs> the card to protect the creature. So okay. I. When they print a card that but, says choose a creature, that yes. play, target player sacrifices that creature. <laughs> then we can talk I, about Enix. Then we can I, talk about Enix. That's right? pretty much where they're at now. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, Krim got me on this card. Krim literally got me on this card. It's one of my favorite uh, like miniature board wipes these days. It's called Make an Example. It's a four mana black sorcery. Mm. It has each opponent wow. separate the creatures they control into two piles. Uh, and then for each opponent, you get to choose one of their piles, and that uh, that opponent sacrifices the chosen pile. Um, so you're guaranteed to kill the the creature you want to kill. So if your opponents are smart and they know what creature you want to kill, they're going to put your creature on one pile and then their other creatures on the other one. But nonetheless, for four mana and sorcery speed, you're going to always kill it. And the thing I also really like about this is you can use it politically. Like if you don't want to screw over a certain player, for example, you can say you could put all of them in one pile. Uh, I'm not going to touch your stuff. And then just deal with the actual threats at the table too. So you don't have to you don't have to annoy everybody at the table at the same time too. You could use it for maximum value, but you could also use it politically. But it will <sighs> always kill that creature. And I love this card. It is ah, I, I love it. Tomer, so is that even a man, a man of fairies protection still gets around that, which is the biggest sure. part of edicts, yeah, right? Sure. right? Like oh, you, you get rid like... of ward and indestructible, but we all know that you really phase Richard. out. In 2024, if you want to protect does yourself. not get but around to fairy protection. Does, split well second. Split doesn't get around. Split second. You can play split oh, second removal. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. If you really sudden, want something dead, right? There's sudden edict. <laughs> sudden edict, sure. But like, like that's that's not, no, that's not the same, right? Like, it also and you got them to board. burn. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't touch your, and they burned it to fairies pro. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> right, like, uh, and uh, like, you've got other like things like Sats Will now as graveyards are being more pot, like, Everything has graveyard recursion. Now you get a powerful edict and a graveyard recursion that could potentially give you a board full of like things. I don't know, man. Edicts are getting a lot better. <laughs> what? And if y'all are, comp I better not see y'all complain about Ward. <laughs> what edicts do you actually play? Like what? Like, give me, give me like two or three edicts that you actually think are like uh, worth putting in a deck. Because maybe I'll try a couple of these. Because I'm still in the like edicts are bad camp. So if I'm gonna try one or two, what would you point me to, Grim? Sats will make an example. Those two are like front runners. And then, of course, even Soul Shatter. Soul Shatter has its applications uh, and is pretty powerful. I play it in my Lazav deck and it feels real nice. Um, so, yeah, like these are just like three that I would name off the top of my head right now. Hmm. I think they've gotten better for sure. And like that is power creep, but it's power creeping hmm. edicts in a way that it's just, uh, they they just get more appealing to me, and I I know I, like I'm not expecting Richard to believe in them <laughs> because Richard doesn't believe in removal unless it's a board wipe. So this you is know a board what? wipe. It's, yeah, it's like yeah, even removal, removal that board doesn't wipe. even kill the thing you want to kill. Yeah. It's like the <laughs> least like, Richardy card ever. More yeah. to not kill the thing you. <laughs> make an example. That's not does. We, we it see that that Enix, if Crip could actually cast them, but probably like half the time he dies, he's holding like four <laughs> conditional removal spells with the conditions. <laughs> 
Whoa! <laughs> he just keels whoa. over. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? All right, I I just bored like, every turn. Like, what's the highest mana value over there? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> that, that question does come up a lot. What's yeah. the biggest power over there? <laughs> oh, okay. I ask that. I ask that on the daily. All right? I just ask that because I want to know. All right, it could be toxic deluge. What's the biggest booty? Right. So. I'm just saying, if there's a lot here, and if your decks are all focused on, like, if you're a control-heavy deck, and you expect your opponents to play around your board wipes, this is how you get them, right? Okay, you don't want to play into my board wipe, that's okay, I'll just answer your one big threat that you are making me answer, until you feel like I don't have a board wipe, and then I sweep you. So, like, I, I don't know, man, I love <laughs> mid <-react>. decks. Touchdown! <laughs> <laughs> love these decks, these cards. Okay, uh, next card, which is a funny card because it's like one of the best white cards of all time. Grand Abolisher. So Grand Abolisher says basically your opponent can't cast spells during your turn, can't interact. So in the olden days, people used to play this to like not get counterspelled, right? Especially if you have a Cavern of Souls, you just like play this down, can't be countered, and then your opponent can't counter stuff. I thought that was like fooey. Like normally you can play around counterspells and like you don't really need it. But I have started including Grand Abolisher in all my decks because of Teferi's Protection. What's the best way <laughs> yeah. to prevent someone from phasing out during your turn? Yeah, it's a... Grand Abolisher, right? Like, you want to board fogs. wipe? Stop Spogs. Stop Spogs? It's not Teferi's Protection. But let's say you want to board wipe and you really want something dead. So you don't go to the Edict, right? You go to the Farewell. But the Farewell, you can phase out still. So you go Grand Abolisher Farewell. Or more realistically, Grand Abolisher uh, Our Revelation. That's five mana. You can guarantee that your opponent doesn't flawless maneuver their way out of it to Fairies Pro. Uh, so there's like so much instant speed interaction now that Grand Abolisher says, nope, right? I'm going to play it. Uh, I don't need to think anymore. You can't interact with me except for like lands. Like lands is one of the things you can actually do still. Uh, and then you just kill them. So this is my answer to the fog meta. This is my answer to Teferi's protection. <laughs> this is my answer to like everybody lives. Like all that crap, like out the door, just grand abolish you. And it has the nice effect of hating on counter spells as well, right? Like now you don't have to play around counter spells or anything. So grand abolish you gets better over time as Wizards prints better and better interaction. And, and this just shuts off everything and they keep making more grand abolishers too there's the, mm -hmm. the new cat there's the one that makes soldiers yeah. the new or something so good the new yeah. cat so yeah good. the new yeah, the, mirror yeah. dragon lord dramoka malamet exemplar it, because dragon lord it's a, dramoka is a meme now seth I, I think you're overpaying right honestly you have the new it, cat you have the new cat the cat's yeah. so good it draws okay. you cards the cat's three yeah. mana and draws, draws cards if the dramoka the has power is greater than base power Dramoka has the upside that it's not counterable either. So, like, yeah. it's actually going to resolve against the Krim deck and shut down future counters. So, I think that's, even it though it's expensive, so much you need that to is untap upside. It, though. Abolish your pay two mana and then do your turn. Whereas Dramoka is like, yeah. pay it, wait to untap, and then do your thing. Yo. If I you're think... a dragon deck, it's great. But, like, yeah, like, like, like Grand Abolisher and the Cat, these are such low mana investments. They're just. What a, you still get to do your turn yeah i still love me a dramoka though it's a five seven flying lifelink like you gotta you, you people were like oh no it costs six mana and then i'm hitting you for five in the air and i'm dies the five life. Well. like dies the fair well. yeah, it's too much for most like, decks. Interact, yeah, your turn. Don't worry, interact of my turn don't worry about yeah. it what yeah. about have you ever played the equipment one uh conquers flail like is that yeah. actually oh, worth playing okay yeah yep. hmm. i need some equipment next for sure Oh, it's cheaper now. I remember it was like a bajillion dollars. Okay. I'll well, it's one. colorless, right? So all the other things we've mentioned are white, white or green white. The equipment is colorless. So if you're in red or something and you want to like do your combo or, uh, you know, not get got by random things, like the equipment is like the only option that you have. It needs to be equipped to a creature, but that's like a pretty easy stipulation. Huh. All right, Seth. Hit us uh, with a card. All right. So this is a card that I think just recently and like the last couple of days got better. I, I'm wearing the cowboy hat for a reason. We're talking Sunforger. So Sunforger 
is a card that I normally think is pretty overrated. I'm not like a big Sunforger fanboy. However, I realize this card keeps getting better and better. So Sunforger, uh, its main thing is an equipment that you can pay to an unattached to tutor up a red or white instant card with converted mana cost four or less, play it without paying its mana cost, three to equip. So essentially this tutors any cheap red instant or sorcery. And the reason this is getting better, so it's getting better in a broad sense that we keep getting more red instants and sorceries that cost four mana or less. But what really made me think about this is the spree mechanic, which is in Outlaws of Thunder Junction. The whole gimmick of the spree mechanic is all the spree cards have mana value of one, but then you can pay extra mana to do uh, extra things with them. And I think the biggest one is Final Showdown. So Final Showdown's the new white mythic spree card, which uh, for six total mana, you can wrath with it, destroy all creatures. You can also give one of your creatures indestructible, make creatures lose all abilities. So the fact that you can use Sunforger to actually tutor up a real hard wrath, I think is kind of a game changer for Sunforger. Before, I think the best option was settle the wreckage, which is kind of like a foggy wrath that can get one person. But the fact that you can have this like hard wrath in your deck, there's also a red one that's pretty good, great train heist that can be ramped by making a bunch of treasures, give you extra combat steps. Uh, so I think these Strive cards in specific really up the value of playing a Sunfall Tutor package. Now that you can get like a real wrath out of it, that's just like a really, really huge deal. So I'm on the I'm on the Sunforge train now, thanks to Spree cards and other similar mechanics. My only, I, I agree. I like the added versatility of it. My only caution is that you still have to pay for the, the Spree extra costs. You do. So, Let's say you want to wrath at instant speed with final showdown using Sunforger. You're going to have to pay uh, red white to activate Sunforger. And then you have to pay three double white. So that's going to be seven mana total. So the difference between that and settle the wreckage is settle the wreckage. You just pay two mana to activate Sunforger and you cast it for free. Whereas this way you pay seven mana. So I... I like I like the the versatility here, but I don't think it's that good because you do have to spend an egregious amount of mana to get the value. Although the flexibility here is really nice, right? You could just pay five mana or something to like give all your stuff indestructible. That's like really cool at instant speed. I like the flexibility. I like it, yeah. but I don't think I, I think some people were like. Ah, you just get the castle for free. It's like no, 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 no. You still no, have you to pay do. seven mana for your wrath. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta pay the additional cost. That is, that is yeah. definitely a good thing to point out in case people didn't realize that. But I still think it's very worth it. In Final Showdown's a card you're gonna want in your decks anyway because it's just like a real instant, the best instant speed wrath now, the cheapest instant speed wrath. So I think uh, just having it one of your tutor options is a big deal. And I really like Great Train Heist as well. The like the mode that makes it so whenever one of your creatures deals combat damage for a turn, you make a treasure is only two total mana is kind of ridiculous plus you can get extra combats yeah. and stuff so so i think this free card the flexibility is really big with sunforger going into my college deck for sure yeah, no <laughs> no not a, not yeah. a fan richard and everyone not a fan. conveniently forgets that it's three mana to cast sunforger plus another three mana to equip plus two mana to activate so if you are not a voltron deck it's incredibly sus even if you are a voltron deck it's still five mana before you get anywhere. Like, I'd rather just play a trouble in pairs and draw eight this, cards rather than like pay this to like attempt to tutor up my one of weird yeah. wrath. You know what I, I mean? Like your yeah. your toolbox I, is not as versatile. It's not like you tutor anything. And there's a bunch of restrictions, right? Like they can kill your creature in response to the equip. You can have absolutely nothing, but you played an onboard tutor. People will just murder you. Right? Like, you can't even untap to get value because no one knows what's coming out. <laughs> Sunforger is incredibly sus. This, this was this is like mind's eye card advantage, right? <laughs> like, you were so desperate back in the day that but you're mind's willing eye's to good. overpay eight mana. <laughs> no. But mine eye's good now, Richard. It's good. You're it's using the same argument. But it's super mad efficient, and it's like... <laughs> You're like, I don't know, late game Hail Mary kind of, so to speak, right? This is kind of it, right? Where you were very desperate. I'd rather just cast the one ring, a trouble in pairs, and just sheer card draw, get the thing I want in hand. By drawing four or five cards, I will get the wrath I'm trying to look for. I'll, I'll get the, you know, swords to plow shares, whatever. Just, just draw cards rather than pay eight mana to tutor something up, right? Like, imagine paying eight was... mana for a tutor. It's ridiculous. <laughs> But I there think is... there was a misunderstanding. I I'm not putting I'm not making su putting Sunforger in random decks now to take advantage of this. That that's crazy talk. I don't know if Seth was on board with that. <laughs> well, there's I am not. I'm saying I have an equipment deck 
it runs Sunforger anyway. I get to equip Sunforge for free, so I might as well switch up some of my instant speed interaction to these spree cards because it gets a little bit better. That's all. I was already and running Sunforger. <laughs> it's good in the deck. I have Pure Steel Paladins and everything. I equip for free. It's fine. But <laughs> that's yeah. the thing. There's a, there's a lot of equipment synergies, right? So yes, yep. if you're just jamming in a random deck, it's going to be a lot of mana to get going. But there's a lot of ways to tutor up equipment, to cheat on the cost of equipping equipment, to cheat on the cost of artifacts. So if you're building a deck that can support it, I think it's it's actually much more efficient than it reads at first glance. Grim. I think, yeah. I think love it. it. I Instant think speed wrath, Grim. Instant like speed wrath. Instant speed. I you can leave your mana the up problem, and counter things. Okay. I like that it is instant speed, <laughs> yes. But and I like that you can wrath. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if I like playing the the artifact to tutor it up. Um Grim hates artifacts, I forgot. He loves everything whoa, whoa, about whoa, it, but yeah, it's an yeah, artifact. Yeah. Hold on, yeah. you, you hold get on, opposition hold on. agent in multiple <laughs> levels here. I I like I like equipment. I don't like mm. artifact decks. They're very different. They are the same type, but they play differently. And so you like my cauldron deck. It's fine though. I, th <clears throat> I think your cauldron deck is funny because why are you just loading your deck up with three really bad pieces together? They're good. <laughs> but, well, just, Sunforger's but, like, there too, so four. <laughs> so okay, oh yeah. <laughs> Sunforger. I I don't I'm know. Like attack. Sunforger is is so weird because I've never seen it resolve and then have that person that has the Sunforger live. Everybody just kills you mercilessly, right? So it kind of like Richard mentioned, it it brings all the aggro, and I guess like all the aggro you can just now blow up the board. So I guess that's pretty cool, but. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe like we're talking about just jamming Sunforger in a random deck. And I, is that because that, that's well, what I'm taking from? I, I, I don't think you can play in a random deck. I think you got to have some some synergies to uh, to support it. You got to be having, you know, equipment theme or something along those lines. Like if you're just jamming in a random deck, you're going to probably have a, a rough go of it. Because like Richard said, it is pretty slow if you don't have any way to uh, synergize yeah. with it or take advantage of it. It's it just feels kind of slow. So like I do like instant speed board wipe though. So I those are the two things in conflict. I mean, <laughs> I'm like I do like instant speed board wipe. I, I think mm -hmm. but that's more of on final showdown than it is the hammer, right? But ah uh, yeah, you know what? It's 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 fine. I I guess it's nice to have the toolbox to be able to yeah. tutor up an instant speed uh, instant speed board wipe. I guess it's fine. I we got there. Sunforgers, I see the season. I don't believe any of you. I don't believe any of you. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm not like, like I'm not like gonna stick it in any deck that has like Boros colors in it. But I, you know, I I can see it. it it's there. All right, Krim, hit us with a card. Uh, so funny if I mentioned it earlier. You know, we talked a little bit about Amulet, but I I'm wondering if now with how many things coming into play like untapped all of that that's actually a, a huge problem like all the like you know the artifacts that are made uh treasures included uh blind obedience has just continued to get better and better hmm. i mean it was already good but it's continuing to get even better and now it's a way for you to also gain like a ton of life back with the extort. It's also it's a win con on top of that, a preventative measure from randomly dying to I don't know. Everything has haste. Everything comes down and like all these artifacts that they, they just do so many busted things nowadays that I just feel like having them being tapped at least helps slow them down a little bit. Uh, and, and, and now more than ever, I just feel like I want to jam blind obedience in just any deck that I can. Ooh. Ooh. Wow, you're you're higher on it than I am. So I think blind obedience, I get the argument for the haste stuff, but for me, I really gotta have synergies for it. I gotta be like a life gain deck or an enchantment deck, just jamming it because I want to. Uh, I don't know. Someone might have a haste creature or something. That's that's a little aggro for me. I think. But it's not, it's not even a haste creature. You know, the artifact part is relevant, and it's a win con on its own. For one mana, it, a it, it, least, con. it, it is a very, it very is, slow, it is a good scroll. Scroll. dude. The extort is so real, <laughs> and if you do not appreciate, if you do not acknowledge how real that extort is, like, oh, oh, I, I mean, I the like play of nice. blind obedience that was just one mana that gave all your spells extort and like nothing else. Like, that's how strong extort is. Like, people wow. don't like life gain, but if you're gaining like 12. 20 life off a single card plus killing your opponent it's at the same subtle. time it's subtle it's very strong 
And like Krim said, I think Treasures puts us over the top. Like everyone combos with Treasures today for whatever reason, right? Like old Nawbone, take infinite turns, whatever, right? It, it all starts with getting Treasures and then looping Treasures. Like Dockside loops don't work if a Blind Obedience is on the battlefield. On top of that, Wizards has in incredibly incentivized attacking, right? So a lot of creatures have haste, come and want to smack you and do something. Well, the haste doesn't matter. And then for you your opponent's blockers are now tapped. So you can get in, get those Toski triggers, like whatever, right? Yeah. So I think Blind Obedience help. is severely underrated. The problem, it's like one of those like weird value cards. It's not like particularly on theme. It doesn't do anything flashy. And like, if you're going to cut a card, you're like, eh, what does this do really, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it's always cut for thematic purposes, but like, it probably should be in your deck. If we had 150 card decks or something, it would probably always go in, <laughs> right? But like, it's got to cut somewhere. But the extort is so strong. Like, just gain eight life off two extort triggers, or gain six life off two extort triggers. Uh, triggers is like incredibly strong. I yeah, I every single like blind obedience is not a, a card that goes into my decks because again, like Richard said, theme reasons. I usually go super hard on like theme and synergy and stuff and this doesn't like act as a source of plashers or something it doesn't feel like necessary but every single time i see it in a game i'm like oh my god this is like the mvp like it shuts down haste it shuts down treasures it puts everybody down like it just slows down everybody else but not you your creatures enter the battlefield tapped so you can't block like it's it's so good. It's always been like, oh my god, and this is two mana, and then you extort on top of it. Um, yeah, I think this card is just very, very good. And Krim is correct about treasures. Like, there's more treasures, so it just gets better, and there's more haste. Yep. It just gets the, better. And, and, like, just look at Outlaws right now, too. Right as it's out, you have flash. So meaning things can get flashed in during your combat. Well, that's fine. It can be tapped. You won't be blocking me. So your combat feels a lot smoother in that sense as well. But what if they have an amulet, Grim? Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, <laughs> we're moving from the fog mana to the amulet mana. Then they listen to the podcast, and that tells you that they're thinking right now, you know? They're thinking because they listen to the podcast. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Last round of cards. I, okay. I think we skipped wait, Homer me? this round. I you think we skipped, skipped me, it. Right yeah. It's all wait. mean. Oh, wait. I, I saw, oh, Tomer, you, you deleted your entry, and I got confused. Yes. All right, Tomer. <laughs> It's over. Out of order. Hit us up. <laughs> All right. So this is this is a card that I feel. I don't know. I brought this up like a year ago. Oh, I'm gonna keep bringing it up until I manifest its awesomeness. Tail's End is a two mana counter spell. It's one in a blue counter target activated ability, triggered ability, or legendary spell. Now I've mentioned this before, like underrated cards, yada yada yada, but like. We're in 2024. It is not the year of Commander. It is the era of Commander. It's a decade of Commander. Everything must be legendary. We're going to have legendary creatures, but you betcha we're going to get more legendary sorceries, you more legendary. Yeah, oh, you bet your you you <laughs> bet your 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 cowboy hat that you're going to keep lassoing some legendary value in the future. Everything's wow. going to be legendary. Everything's going to be legendary. Um, and so Tails End is going to go from two mana counter some specific thing to like two mana counter literally everything you want to be countering. And then, oh, by the way, it can double as a stifle effect. So an activated ability, a triggered ability, you also get that value too. No more Thassa's Oracles ruining your day. You know, you could just counter that as well. Um, yeah, this card just keeps getting better or just getting more legendary. It's the concentration of legendaries keeps going up. Every single threat in Commander is going to be legendary, and this is not going to be conditional anymore. It's just going to be a, like just like a s true staple. So here's that's my he hot take. Here's my my issue with Tails End. So I do agree. There's more legends than ever, so it hits more things than ever. Anything that refers to legends is getting rapidly better with the proliferation of legends. But my issue with Tails End is I don't think it does the most important thing that I want my counter spells to do, which is to protect my win condition so I can win the game. Like, yes, mm. it's good at being like, ha ha, I got your commander, or ha ha, I got your threat, because a lot of threats are legendary, but it's not very good at, okay, I'm trying to do my thing this turn and force through the win and take you out, because most of the time, what my opponent's gonna use to stop my win is not gonna be 
a legend or a activated or triggered ability. So that's my one issue with it. So I agree it's getting better, but I still don't really put it in my deck because I really like my counters to be able to like protect my game plan more than just annoy my opponent's game plan. You're very correct, Seth. Um, I have nothing else to say. <laughs> no, but I still think it's good. It is getting better. I agree. I agree. It's, it's, the, it's the edict argument. Like, are, these cards whoa, whoa, are getting whoa, whoa, better whoa, whoa, and better. Whoa, whoa, whoa. There's no denying it. But what slot does it take in your deck? Because a counter spell is not two mana. It's free. Like, free is what you're competing against for, like, a generic counter spell, right? Like, Fierce Guardianship, uh, stuff like that. And also, we have Tishana's Tidebinder, which stifles but keeps it stifled, right? Because if they're going, like, infinite with an ability, you, you counter it, like, okay, well, I'll just go again, right? So, like, things that can be repeated don't get stopped by Tail's End. So, yeah, I don't like this. Plus, you can't force through your things. So, yes, it got better, but when you just play Arcane Denial and just call it a day, like, this still no, doesn't stop the No, because abilities. You what can, about like, Dress Down? And like, I feel Dress Down. Right. If you're trying to, like, catch okay. random things, like, a Dress Down also helps. I don't know about Tails End. It seems so conditional. I feel it's... Depends. If you're playing a Crim deck where you have eight counter spells, then yeah, this is yeah. be included, right? Because you're just going to... I actually don't burn play them this. at will. Oh. But if you have, like, two counter spells, like, this can't take a spot. Like, you got to use a real counter spell, right? All right, you're Crim all deck, laughing deck, now. Don't, don't play this. I, you're, and, and mostly because, Tomer, it isn't that versatile, right? Like... There's so many more counter spells I would run before this. I always think this card is sick. It may be good in like a brawl deck where I am literally just all counter spells or like a like just I need a just a a critical mass of cheap spells to fire off. But in a control deck, I do need my counter spells. Like I I think that fierce guardianship's already narrow enough being non creature. So so like that I don't know how much more how many more narrow counter spells I can load in. But I do like the card, but I always find it being like, really, it's not the 101st card. I think it's like the 106th card. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It's very that's not pretty high. If it's in the top 110 or something, that's, that's close. close. Yeah. That's close. That's, that's pretty close. That's very valid. Like, I also prefer my counter spells to protect my own things as well. So that's very true. However... I'm gonna give it. I'm gonna give it one, like two years maximum. Two years maximum before we get power crept swords to plowshares, where it's a legendary spell. Yeah. Well, mark my words. It's only gonna be two years from and now. That would gonna power Richard, creep. Wait, that's terrible. <laughs> what? Like legendary to fairies protection. Legendary. legendary fog. Legendary swords. <laughs> yeah. Legendary overrun. Then we're in yes. business. That's probably true. Yeah, yeah. But are we happening? It's probably wait, but happening, are, right? are we talking about? Would they require you to have a legendary on board? Because that's terrible. No. No, it just says legendary instant, so you can't have two on the stack. I have yes. no idea what that would be. <laughs> that's a, yeah, exactly. Wait, what? It's just so what it can be used to make this card better. What about yeah. it's just it would be like sword slashers, but you could only run one if you run this in your deck, you could only have one in your deck, and then boom. <laughs> That's legendary. It draws you a card, by uh. the way, too. It's just sword splashes, but it draws you a card. Okay. We're gonna get there. Uh, Whatever. You'll see. On on to the final round proper now. Uh <laughs> This is an old card, Crop Rotation, which I didn't understand why people used to run this. <laughs> like, people used to run Crop Rotation all the time. Same with Haro, uh, which is like a ramp spell that only ramps one but puts, you know, a card in the graveyard. But in 2024, Crop Rotation is insane because you have so many targets that green has an answer to everything. And unlike... Unlike Sunforger, you don't need a six <laughs> mana plus two mana investment to make this work, right? Because for one mana, you can fetch up a maze of it to, to fade a blocker. You can fetch up a glacial chasm to fade literally everything. You can fetch up a field of the dead to get a body, which could be a blocker or attacker. You can fetch up a uh, temple of the false god, which is ramp. Uh, you can fetch up a surveil land or something if you really want. You can fetch up like Sajiri step or something to get protection to force through an attack. You can fetch up Rogue's Passage, Urza Saga. Like there's like a billion things you can fetch up. This card is like ultra staple and it becomes better because every set they release better lands. And this is this is the true Sunforger. If you want to play Sunforger, <laughs> play this instead. Like this is one mana, okay? No onboard investment. No one sees it coming, right? And you have an answer for literally everything in your deck, and it costs you nothing. It was your land slot, right? With Sunforger, 
you got to add like this package of like six to eight cards. You got to take out other stuff for it, right? This is like you take out all your basics and then you put in the utility lands and crop rotation is good to go, right? And you can always get Ancient Tomb. It's always just straight up ramp if you, if you need it to be. So crop rotation, greatest card ever made like 20 years ago. Get, keeps getting better. <laughs> I mean, you're not wrong. The card is like, and I don't even think this will ever be topped. Like, I don't think we'll see another instant speed, non-basic land tutor that puts land into play untapped. I would be very surprised. Like, we don't have anything else that's our, even our close to it, do we? Charm. Our Archie Charm, Charm is three like two months ago. It doesn't require yeah. a sack, but it's triple green. It's triple it's, green. That's a It's lot. triple green and also like slices and dices and makes you a, a, a healthy salad with your favorite toppings. <laughs> that's true. That's true. But it comes into play tapped, right? It comes in, so you can't get a maze of it and immediately use it. You like it still it still comes into play tapped. Yeah. Crap rotation comes into play untapped, right? So you can just immediately, yeah, it's kind of wild. Yes. No, they're so, both great. But Archery was from is very good. But yeah, I'm, I mean, I agree. You can probably just play this in any deck. This is kind of going back to what we were talking about with off color fetches and forest ramp and bounce lands. The lands just keep getting better. They keep getting better and better. And the more good lands there are, the more good, like, you have this tutor package built into your deck accidentally just by building a mana base. So the higher the value of being able to get any land in your deck is. I, I guess this is, I don't know, this is one of numerous things that are, are problematic in green for me. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, like, like, this is. Oh, God, I hate that they could just instant speed go get a land, and lands are so, like, hard to interact with. And, uh, yeah, like, holy shit. You need Tails End to stifle. You can't count yes. the crop rotation, but you there can you stifle go. the maze of it and get them. <laughs> That's worse. Uh, like, or <laughs> you, you just make a bunch of more opposition agents at cheaper interaction points. I'm just saying. Shadow of right. Doubt on one mana. Free for Xe into like mana. That's what I want. But yeah, this this card is good, and it is good because of those reasons, right? Like it is just able to go pull anything from anywhere, uh, any any land you need, and uh, at instant speed, it's really annoying. And it's only one mana. It's only one mana. It's so <laughs> it's <broken>. so good. <laughs> it's so broken. it's so good. It's it it just scales better. Obviously, the better lands come out, the better this gets. Yeah, it's very, 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 very good. You have to the, run the, like some good cards. The, the key is it has Lance. old color color pie breaking cards like Glacial Chasm and yeah. Mazovith are there. They'll never reprint these kind of cards again, but they're already here. So yep. you can keep using Wizards design mistakes from like 25 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> That's what makes it crazy, right? Like Sunforger, like the existing package is like mediocre. Right? Like, imagine if Ancestral Recall was in white or something, right? And you're like, well, I can just fetch that up every single game. Don't worry about it, right? Like, every yeah. new card is balanced. <laughs> we have these old, broken, unbalanced cards that we can keep getting forever and forever. And we're not even talking about Cradle or Sarah Sanctum. You can get that with Crop Rotation as well, right? Like, there's all these, like, broken lands you can keep fetching up forever. So, they really need to ban this, but I think they're just going to make another one at two mana. If Archeus Charm was three mana, they're gonna make a crop rotation for two mana that just like straight up puts a land into play, and uh, it's gonna be disgusting. <laughs> couldn't couldn't you argue a lot of that for any tutor really? Like are tutors in general just getting better because the cards keep getting better, and you can find the old mistake cards that are still allowed. Like it kind of seems like all tutors are just like slowly increasing, right? In value. It's true, got... but it doesn't remove the mana cost. Like, the, the, like it's a one mana that puts it into play. Like we don't have a tutor. Like imagine there's a tutor that said like, play this card for free. Then that's yeah. like ridiculous, right? Yeah. But you still got to pay the mana cost. Like crop rotation just gives you the land and it does its thing immediately. And it mm -hmm. doesn't cost a slot. Like it doesn't cost a true slot on your theme right like you're, you're cutting basics or like dual lands or something at most right like that that's the biggest problem i have with sunforger so i think crop rotation will never be bested like it's one of the best cards of all time yeah you're probably right actually all right seth what do you got for us all right we, we couldn't go through a whole podcast without uh bringing up the fog meta so uh, i had to <laughs> oh my god <laughs> i got so actually crim is the one that made me think of this so a few weeks ago we were doing commander clash i was feeling pretty good i had my hands rag out it was pretty early in the game you know nothing crazy was happening i'm at like 40 life and all of a sudden crim's just like oh laza put phage in the graveyard attack you you're gonna die i'm like what am i supposed to do about this it's like turn four like in most commander decks are like that many commander decks 
Bucks have a way that they can do this big pop off turn and win by surprise. Because I think the big argument against Fogs is, oh, just wrath them, right? Like, why would I want a Fog when I could just wrath the board and deal with it permanently? Which makes sense. But cards keep getting so much more powerful, uh, so much more powerful, and commanders keep getting so much more powerful, and things are so snowbally that many decks have this ability to maybe not as fast as Krum's Laws of like combo kill, but in the mid to late game to assemble this big turn where they go from not looking very scary to potentially making you die that turn so you don't even have time to cast a farewell it just doesn't even work so i think the value of for no mana or one mana just being like all right i'm not gonna die to your combat shenanigans this turn just keeps going up and up as decks get faster and have these more explosive kill turns did you just are, are you trying to get sympathy for for playing your ansrag deck which then took every <laughs> combat after to be richard incorrectly killing me i'm just saying <laughs> i really the would. biggest punts of my life <laughs> i'll never live it down but it was i'm just so saying funny. i really wanted to fog that turn like it would have been a very good turn to have a fog in hand <laughs> yeah yeah true true uh. Uh. i i mean i i i agree that like some fogs they're they're good because they're man efficient and i i did go from being like the only fogs i care about are like teferi's protection and ink shield to now i actually do believe for most of my decks i would like to run one fog you know yeah, like, there you I go i do not care about playing it go. early on but usually my it. fogs i want them to do other things as well that's why i love everybody plays teferi's protection it is a fog but it literally does like a bajillion different things but it is a fog everybody runs it um I don't think I'd, 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 I'll run Obscuring Haze maybe. Fog? Just straight up fog. No other utility. <laughs> just... So, oh, so just to be oh, clear, I, I'm referring more far. to fogs as as a as an archetype of card rather than fog in specific. So, if you want to argue that like it's Angel Song because I can cycle it, or it's Dawn Charm because I get extra value out of it. So, if you wanna if you wanna think of it that way, that's sure. that is perfectly acceptable. Because I don't so usually run point. literal fog, but I do run a fog or two. I will run literal fog in non-green, right? Because green has the upside of obscuring haze, which is free, constant mist, and things like that. But if you're in black, well, darkness, darkness. Is, your only, darkness is your only choice. And that's just literal fog, right? But I hard disagree with Seth. Fog has always been good. <laughs> like the, the best, the, the best <laughs> fogs have been around for literally ever, right? Constant no. mist. Obscuring haze is like pretty old. Uh, like just straight up fog, like darkness, glacial chasm, glacial crevasses. These are like ancient cards. Here's the thing. In Commander, combo is poo-pooed on. You're not allowed to play combo, right? Like, like you, you combo, be like, oh, nice kiki combo, right? So what does that mean? Everyone needs to attack with giant creatures. And typically, they try to get you by surprise. Because if you, if, you if you just put a big board down and don't attack, people wrath it, right? That's bad. So they, they come in with the haste. And then you have a one to zero mana spell that says counter your turn. That is absolutely ridiculous, right? Fog has always been good. We've just been too dumb to recognize it. You know, it, it took like pushing over the top with obscuring haze into fairies protection. Like, to fairies protection, the one ring has normalized fog for us. So we're like, oh, actually, having a one turn off, like I survive one more turn is like actually very convenient, right? Like, so fog has always been good. Like nothing's changed. We've always been combat oriented. A lot of combo decks are combat oriented, right? Like infinite combats, like sort of feast and famine, like that kind of crap, right? So I really like, it. especially with green obscuring haze, a lot of them are creature focused. So it fogs the creature damage, not even just combat damage. So like if you're trying to kill with Imodane or something, obscuring haze takes care of that as well. So this has always been good. We've just been too dumb to recognize it. I, I halfway agree. Like, Fogs <laughs> have probably always been good, but it's also, like, now our four drops or six sevens or whatever, five sixes, you know, they just keep getting bigger. The creatures are bigger. They're more snowball -y. The odds of dying right away go higher. So I feel like they have to be getting better to some extent just because, like, as creatures get more powerful, Fogs also get more powerful, right? So as we power creep creatures, it's got to make Fogs at least a little better. Kramer, are you going to run Fog yet? I, we got Tomer. I, I, we got Tomer. I, 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 I'm like, I, I run you like know. Paris, bro. <laughs> you Come know on, Krim. Like Come on, Krim. Yeah, because it I blows don't. you out, right? So you should run <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's OP. It's OP. <laughs> I, don't, not, I don't like it because I think it's just not 
efficient, <laughs> except for a few, right? <laughs> like, I think Teferi's pro, sure. Uh, like, uh, Obscuring Haze is not it, but sometimes they play it for the memes. Like, you, I'm playing it for the shield? gag. Are you an ink shielder? I, I, I believe I believe ink shield has more application because you can at least close oh. out a game after the damage. Okay, um, that's my favorite but, one. Well, or even arachnogenesis, even right, like like anything that gives yeah. you bodies. Then sure, okay. I look at it as a fog, like in a sub level, but at its main level, it's a actual way to deploy a ton of bodies. Fog itself, no, I I would not. I don't think normal fogs alone are that good. Ooh. Ooh. You've never, I think, you've never survived a turn because of a darkness, then Grim or a angel I, song I look, or look, a holy I've day. I've definitely been on the the blowout <laughs> end of like, oh, I got fogged, right? Like, yeah, sure, but like, <laughs> yeah, Grim doesn't attack. Also... So the fog doesn't bother. Yeah, yeah I guess that's yeah, true. yeah. He does it when he has like eighty counter spells in hand. So your fog is useless at this point. <laughs> yeah, or or questing. But to Seth's easy. point, because card draw is so good now, it's okay to play this conditional card that isn't used until like the the last turn of the game right like you're only deploying it when you're about to die and then you're going to untap and win you you can afford to play these cards now because you always have like seven cards in hand back like eight years ago you were like scraping off the bottom of the barrel like top deck and like you don't want to draw this fog in the middle of nowhere right oh. but now you have so many cards it's worth it to play that fog to make sure you survive another turn and that turn will let you actually finish the game that's that's where I'm at with fogs. Is like I will run one in my deck. I'm not running two unless it like unless it does progress my board. Like my favorite ones are what Crim says. The ones that progress my board while being able to fog. Those are the ones that I'm always aiming for. I like running one in the deck because I also agree with with Richard. Like uh, a lot of my metas have shifted away from combo. Combo people do not like. Uh, people like there's a stigma against it, unfortunately. And, uh, you know, there's always like the aristocrats deck that drains you out as well, too. But the vast majority are going to be combat. And while I, I'm a firm believer, believer of cheap instant speed removal, which also can save you from alpha strikes, this one is just the most efficient way of doing it. And having one in the deck in a deck, uh, in a com combat heavy meta where people are just trying to alpha strike each other, I think is definitely worthwhile. You got me, Richard. You got me. We're doing it. One. One, one next, though. Your next trip. Trip. One, though. One fog. <laughs> no. All right, it's over. No. Hit us, hit us with the card. All right. Okay, so this one, this one is like a personal, like, just a fist bump moment for my favorite Voltron commander of all time. It just keeps getting better. So this is Skullbriar the Walking Grave, and I'm gonna pitch to you why you should build a Skullbriar deck as well. This is a black green, so two mana, one one, legendary creature, zombie elemental. It has haste, and whenever it deals combat damage to a player, put a plus one, plus one counter on it. Counters remain on Skullbriar as it moves uh, to any zone other than the player's hand or library. So if Skullbriar has like two plus one plus one counters on it and it dies and you put it into the graveyard or you put it into the command zone, for example, the next time you cast it or it go goes back onto the battlefield, it will come back with those counters and you get to have a super fun time with it. This was like my favorite Voltron deck in like 2012 or 2011, whenever it came out. I was super stoked about it. It sucked. It was actually horrible back then because you'd be like oh yeah plus one plus one counters it grows it's great well it starts off very small which is problem number one problem number two people have like a dozen turns to deal with it and then problem number three back in 2011 you know what the best board wipe was that everybody was running black sun zenith <laughs> yeah all creatures get negative one negative one counters and guess what they'll stick so you <laughs> get like around. five negative one negative one counters <laughs> we'll and he dies well guess what <laughs> nobody plays black sun zenith anymore it's gone nobody nobody deals with that nonsense anymore my boy is free <laughs> my boy is free to be played again it and, might be and, time to bring it back though that card did it was a board wipe shuffled itself back in oh please don't please don't look skullbriar yeah. skullbriar friends rejoice then <laughs> A, a great thing happened. I think it was like 2020 or something. I Corey happened. And now we have keyword counters. So what? You could put like menace counters, lifelink counters, visualist counters, plus one plus one counter, death touch counter, all the keyword counters. You could put it on Skullbriar and they stick. And then what do we get? We get indestructible counters too. So now it has hexproof counters, indestructible. My boy keeps all the beautiful Voltron counters all day long and he's just getting better 
and he just keeps getting better and better and better. And like we got shadow counters from like the Lord of the Rings set. And I think we recently got some more counters too. Uh, I'm blanking on like the most recent sets, but my boy keeps getting better. Oh, Death Touch counter from that uh, the new Thunder Junction. Vraska joins the the crew or whatever the heck. It's so good. He's so good. Play and him. That, He's so and fun. that doesn't even include like the Ozolith and hardened scales yes. effects. Like the proliferation of like synergies for counters, I think keeps going up. Although you still get wrecked if it gets bounced, right? If someone just cyclonic rifts, it sets you back to zero. <laughs> oh, you can put it. You can right? put it to your command zone. Ouchies. You can put it to command zone. Oh, okay, okay. So you're pretty safe then to like. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. So the rules changes actually help it too, like the tuck rule going away and stuff. Because I was thinking you'd get wrecked, but I guess like that also improves Skullbriar. Hmm. Yeah, it doesn't. I have agree to go with Tomer. Skull, Skullbriar is a black green deck, and so it can run open the way. It can run the drop rotation. <laughs> you can it run, can run the, the one rings. So the yes, spot. the deck has gotten better, Tomer. I agree. With you. <laughs> Every deck can run the Come one on. rings. Come sure. on, keyword <laughs> counters though. It's so cool. It's such a cool deck, you guys. And yeah, Ozolith doubles it. So it leaves if it leaves the battlefield, you put all the counters onto it. But then it enters the battlefield with its own counters, and then you can move all the counters from Ozolith. So it literally doubles. Yeah. The Does counter. it have haste? Yes, it has it haste. Has it's, it's a bad, one one with haste, no trample, no evasion, but it's a one one with haste and it grows and it's so so, cute. so Voltron's gotten better because of things like Robe of Stars, Galadriel's Dismissal, like these like cheap ways to just phase out your creatures. But Skullbrite, you don't need to. You just let him die. You let him come back. Let him die. <laughs> it's like two mana the as animated. the tax. Uh, so maybe. Unearth him. You could pay one mana, unearth, bring him back from the graveyard and he's haste. He's a, he's a cute little skeleton boy. I love him. <laughs> to find you one but I, I i think i think open the way is the best addition to the deck though oh, <laughs> you open the way to feel the dead and then you can win don't worry yeah, <laughs> yeah skull is kind of way better <laughs> skull got um. way better <laughs> you can run all the edicts in skull look at that, look at that. Look wow at power out yeah. of control <laughs> exactly what we needed take all the lessons learned from this podcast and make a skull deck and add all those guys <laughs> done <laughs> <laughs> all, all we needed was to make it Sultai. As soon as they give uh, Skullbriar a partner or something, then you can add Tails End and you'd be golden. Uh, Where's Cowboy Skullbriar? Ooh, give him a cowboy hat. Krim, hit us with the last card that's gotten better. There's so many that I want to talk about, but like, I think now more than ever, you see me like it, you see me talk about it and it, it, it has to be draw punishers. They've gotten a lot better just in effect because now you're seeing orcish bowmasters. You're see like you you know notion thief. Everybody loves notion thief. We know that unanimously. Uh, but now we're also seeing like bowmasters, which is actually like closing out the game, pinging people down, and also just giving you like the a, a clock. Right? We, we we love that. We're now seeing where everything in the game has draw a card attached to it. And this is, it is so much more than just, like, nowadays it is so much more than just me trying to troll you and prevent you from drawing. It is now a need. I actually need to stop you from drawing. Because Seth, uh, <laughs> who likes to just sit and draw um. for an, a, an excessive amount through most of the games, right? And how they win is they essentially, if you've seen an anime, specifically any anime, all of them have it, they all, in every battle one. There's a charging scene. Let's just go with Dragon Ball, right? He's got the spirit bomb, <laughs> right? Spirit He's bomb. charging, right? And everybody is lending their power to him, right? And that is, <laughs> that, that, that is except there's no the lending of power. <laughs> they, yeah. He's eating it. <laughs> Seth is their spirit bomb. And he may think, oh, I'm not the threat, but look at me. I only, I'm discarding the hand size every turn because all I've done is drawn cards. But how could I draw more cards, right? Every card has that. And now to prevent the excessive drawing player at the table from excessively drawing, I think we need more of these. I think they are now an, at an all-time high in, like, demand. Because just go through, like, like, like the Thunderdome set, and you're already seeing there's tons of draws to attach things. Like, it's just thrown on there, right? And if it's not that, it ramps. Just random things ramp here. So... <laughs> I, I'm honestly at, at a crossroads and uh, right now deciding between either draw punishers or some way to actually punish ramp. And more than ever, we need it because both of these effects are attached to everything now. So I, I think that 
Like, I, 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 Bowmaster, Notion Thief, uh, hell, even Unlock, Unlock the Boy, the Hall Breacher. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> no. Unlock the Boy. Because wow. There's, there's God. so much draw, no. pun, like, draw power no. attached to everything. Unlock. No. Let him go. No. No. I don't even care if I get dumpstered by it. Just let him go at this point because there's just too many things. And then I, all, uh, I, yeah. I, I, I agree with cards. Okay, we've had so many games of Clash this season where multiple people are sitting on like 30 card hands. Like yeah. multiple people. We're just sitting around like, I don't know what to do with this. But the problem is draw punishers are never enough because if someone is drawing that many cards, they'll take your five bowmasters damage and then they'll just kill the bowmasters because they just drew like a million cards. So it, or you it know needs to be them. hand size hate or something, right? Like deal like three damage for each card you have in hand or something, <laughs> right? <laughs> you just like get them. Like we we need harder hate because the new Jin we... Gitaxius, the, the the whatever should like the the saga or something like that, or or even the the Kamigawa one should have been the ten mana effect where it reduces opponent hand size, zero. yeah, like to zero. I yeah. I don't like Fjoldreds, but like. I really don't like them paired with wheels. You know, like it should. Sure. It, I I hope they do more shieldred type effects where it's not. It's only if your opponents do something to draw extra cards, not if they just straight up just draw extra cards. Because put, pairing off wheels, like yeah, it gets a little bit tedious. You know, to to see that happening over and over again. That's a big problem with Hull Breacher. Was that you end of turn turn three or something? Hull Breacher, untap cast your windfall or whatever and now everybody has no hands anymore you know but I do I'm totally oh, right great <laughs> wonderful <laughs> but but if it's just like a whole breacher type effect that if your opponents are doing stuff to draw your cards like Ashiok template do the Ashiok template where it's not like punishing your opponents for forcing them to be shuffle to shuffle it's just like whenever they shuffle you know um I'm fine with that yeah, like if it has to be that way, sure. Effects and cards that your opponent have and own require them to draw cards and punish them. That's the main thing. I am so tired of those games where people just like sit there and pile on all these cards. <laughs> so now it's like, I feel like people. Don't people. you just sit there with a the hand there? Counters? The I'm so confused. People with yeah, cowboy hats counters, on. Cow counters are actively bad. <laughs> right like unless the whole table is playing like a bunch of counters. like no like great because the, the counters are one for oneing, and you're there just throwing things into the wind because like i have 70 spells right okay i have 70 cards you have four counter spells you're going to use them <laughs> and i think that there needs to be a way to keep it all like like not seth specifically i'm just right, talking yeah, in general yeah. this is this is an actual thing where everything has draw a card attached to it that is true so, i think hull breacher Effect targeting one person. So the, the biggest problem with Bowmasters is the minute you play it, everyone's trying to kill it because everyone's trying to draw a card. Like, you know, one person may be drawing 10 a turn, the other person drawing two a turn. The two a turn person still mega pissed and trying to kill Bowmasters. Yeah. So if you could slap down the Bowmasters and target only Saffron Olive, then it has a very good chance of surviving. It also prevents the wheel effect. You only destroy Seth, but there's two other players that'll probably take issue with the fact that you just like basically Narset wheeled. And then they have the resources to kill you. So I think like a Bowmasters effect or a Notion the effect where you target one player will will keep this at bay and then I don't, the, that's the biggest problem with staff I don't think everyone removes ever, it hmm. everyone will just kill bowmasters regardless of what's happening right like Bow they'll Master's just all not kill a piece. don't you think that just don't you think that'd just be a big feel bad for most tables though where it's just like hey you don't get to play the game but everyone else does like I don't hey, know if that's the kind of card that the game I'm gonna draw 42 cards and when you do anything it's the illusion that you're doing something but really I have the answer <laughs> is the same as not playing the game <laughs> what, what if you suspend think... the card draw instead of drawing a card you put it in exile with like counters on it and then in like three turns you yo can that would be <laughs> sick so that, that way so like... sick wasn't there like a Doctor Who thing that like there was like an is it Doctor Who thing or was it Ma Ian Malcolm? There was something like that where it's like if you're drawing too many cards, you're getting punished a little bit. I, I swear it was like one of those two things. Am I crazy? I think, I think you're thinking of Ian Malcolm, the three uh, card, three drop in is it, right? 
Yeah, yeah. whenever like, a player draws their second card each turn, that player exiles the top card of their library. During each player's turn, that player may cast a spell from uh, among cards they don't own, exile yeah. with Ian Malcolm. So it's like you get you to draw your cards. share a river of cards yeah. that have all been exiled. You get to draw your cards, but everybody else gets to benefit from you drawing cards by, you know, getting card draw yeah, as well, too. That's not bad. I think that's like a very, that's a very safe way of doing it. But maybe it's like so safe that nobody plays it. <laughs> yeah, I've never seen anyone play it, actually. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Because it even works on yourself. It's fully symmetrical. But like, I think there is a design space. And I also just want more red spells that just like burn. Like, deal. It, each opponent takes damage equal to the number, like twice the number of cards in their hand. Something like yes. that. That isn't speed. Give me a hand like press of progress. Just end the game. I mean, they like, exist. It's called like cards. the rack or the vice, whatever. Like the ones that like more than four cards in hand, but they're so slow. Give me an instant yeah. speed one that does max Fever damage. Divisions. At yeah, a, give me, a give cheaper me like, fevered visions, and also the damage they take at the end of their turn is exponentially higher than two damage. <laughs> <laughs> exponentially. Yeah. I mean, aren't there a bunch of red spells that do it? We just don't really play them. I feel like there's Are a there? few. There's like Ignite Memories, which is like a storm finisher, but that's the only one that I can think of. What that? That's like you choose a card at random and deal damage equal to that. Oh, that, that doesn't. But that doesn't something. do a lot. There's like, I don't know. There's some nonsense. Are you telling me there's a good. price of progress for hand size and we haven't been playing it? So I know that this well, is you meta. So I know there's like sort of, sort unquenchable of of Fury, which well, is Warren, Aura. Sort of War of Peace does it. Yeah, Sword of War of Peace, Unquenchable oh. Fury. I oh, I feel like there's a, a, just a red spell that does it, but maybe it's like Fateful Showdown that's based on how many cards. No, Fateful Showdown. Damage to any target equal to the number of cards in, oh, I guess that's your hand, so that's not as exciting. Then you're the, <laughs> you're the bad like guy. seven damage, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, card draw, I mean, it is true that everything draws a card these days, so I think finding the right balance to hate on it makes sense, but I imagine that everything draws a card these days because Watsi has gotten the message that people like playing with full hands of magic cards so i don't expect yeah. them to like punish it too heavily because it seems like they must feel like this is the right direction for the game yeah they want everybody you, you, to have like too many options at any given time you never want to be in top back mode that feels bad so you need to have at least seven cards also impulse draw like you can't really punish impulse draw right unless you have janet sure. magistrate that doesn't count just survive the turn <laughs> <laughs> Like you, you oh, really, the problem is like Bowmasters is a point in time. It's like a counter spell. If you don't have it the moment they pop off, you're screwed. So we really need the thing more. that catches them after they've popped off. Like they have 30 cards in hand. So you do need the is. price of progress. Here it is, Richard. Up. Rune Flare Trap. Six mana. How much mana? In six mana. <laughs> but if your opponent drew three or more cards this turn, one red mana. Damage equal number of cards in the player's hand. Son of that damage. is That's not it. enough. It cool. needs to be it, like three times the this, number. This, this is of Richard's cards new deck. Hand. Ninety-eight random cards, a price of progress, <laughs> and whatever the heck Seth just said, I will close out all <laughs> games with this. <laughs> That's all you need. Just one progress and one of these, and the game is over. <laughs> That's actually kind of true. <laughs> I like it. I like it. I like it. We're getting I gotta figure out of this. I gotta dig up this card. But yeah, price of progress is probably a, an honorable mention too. It's like two mana deal d double. To each po each player takes double the damage equal to the number of non. -ba I forget how it's called. Uh, it's yes. non basic two lands, but it doesn't it. do anything about cards in hand, right? It's more punishing with the ramp player. Yeah, or but it, the, just ends it yeah. punishes ramp. That's what Krim I is. like. That's my favorite one. It's two mana instant, one in a red, deal damage to each player equal to twice the number of non-basic lanes that player controls. I think I need to run this card more. Y'all are getting too greedy. <laughs> Richard's I can't pulled blood it off. You, so I have to do the next Ooh. thing. Richard's I definitely won games with it. All my red decks. <laughs> it is so good. It is so good. Yeah. That, that's the only non-basic land hate that's acceptable in Magic the Gathering. You play a Ruination, everyone's going to cry. You play Armageddon, everyone's going to cry. Even Canound and Confundrum, everyone will kill you. The price of progress, they dead. They can't yeah, what play. what can they do? <laughs> <laughs> There's no retaliation. You scoop up your like, cards. I, I, I play like 37 non-basics and a price of progress. I don't even care. Oh my god. They have True. Ferguson art. If they oh, aren't yeah, there yes. to play, they, are out of, they can't complain. Yep. <laughs> All right, so those are cards that have gotten better over time. Let us know in the comments what you think. Are there any cards that have gotten better over time? Uh, let us know what you think about Skullbriar Edicts. <laughs> I, Skullbriar is Bounce good. Land, I He's think not Bounce good, Lands is more interesting. Bounce Lands are like really hated by a large portion of the community. Uh, so 
uh, curious. Or Sunforger. Sunforger is beloved by a large mm-hmm. portion of the community. Mm-hmm. So what do you guys think about those cards? Have they gotten better? Has Outlaws of Thunder Junction powered these cards up? Let us know in the comments, and uh, we'll see you all back here next week.